Well, good morning. Good morning. And uh, happy Mother's Day to the mothers. We'll, we'll, we'll give you some, a little bit of time in a few moments. But just had a couple of announcements wanted to go over real fast. Um, first of all, on Mother's Day, we're doing things a little bit differently than, than we normally do. Uh, there will be no uh, ladies uh, night tonight, no uh, small group for the ladies tonight. Enjoy your time with your families. And uh, the Wallens Community Group this, this, this week is canceled. I have to be out of town for work. Um, next Sunday, Robert Reese will be filling in for me. And uh, very excited to have Robert come and share next Sunday. So that will be uh, uh, coming up. And then today is Ryan and Maggie's last Sunday. And it's also Zach and Sarah's last Sunday. And we'll hear a little bit from Zach and Sarah at the end of the service. We're going to have some special time of prayer for them. And uh, so make sure you get, get by. Let them know that you will be praying for them. Ryan and Maggie on Friday are leaving for Nepal. Uh, she informed me that they were homeless now. Uh, as of last night, they moved out of their, is it last, today? Today, today they're moving out of their apartment. And uh, they actually will be staying with their mom and dad uh, for about a week. Headed out Friday to Nepal, and they'll be staying there for a while. So, very excited about that, and uh, excited about today. I, I hope that you're here with a heart that's ready to worship, and I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing together. <laughs> Let it be of the grace that 
kindness of Jesus that draws me in. What a day.
Thank you. Be seated. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Zach to come and uh, share a little bit about what they're doing. And um, I, I so have grown. I'm so glad you guys got to come back for a while. And uh, I, I just appreciate their heart, their love for the Lord. And uh, we just enjoyed having them here around the church. They're a blessing in every way. And um, Zach and Sarah are going to be leaving Tuesday. And I'm not going to steal his thunder because I asked Zach to kind of share what their next step is um, in, their, in their ministry. So, Zach, if you could come and uh, share a little bit about your ministry and then uh, bless our offering. Um, so, most of you I've met, and some of you I haven't had a chance to get to know as well, um, but I'm Zach, and uh, Sarah and I, I married Sarah Spencer, who <laughs> most of you guys <laughs> have known for quite a while. Um, so, this, this time that we've had here has been absolutely uh, incredible, uh, and God has used it immensely to minister to Sarah and I um, as a new married couple, and uh, for those of you that, that don't know, it is Sarah and I's goal and dream that one day we would uh, follow the steps of Ryan and Maggie and make it to the to the mission field full time. Um, as of now, we're kind of just taking step by step, and, and as the Lord brings things into our path, uh, we're doing our best just to be obedient to, to him. And he's worked that out with coming up here, and as our time came to a close, we knew that May was kind of our, our end goal. guy in college who used to spend time mentoring me, and he runs a camp in Pennsylvania, right on the border of Pennsylvania and New York, uh, and it's a camp for uh, adults Asian from, uh, ranging in age from 16 to 94 um, with uh, kind of like with handicap, uh, adult handicap, um, and the camp, they, they kind of bring in the campers they have two different sections. It's one of them is a one-on-one, -on -one, and those are for campers that need one-on-one -on -one special attention, 24-hour uh, care. And then they also do a two-week stay, uh, which is about five campers to a counselor. Uh, and I've worked at the camp before for half of the summer, and it was an incredible uh, experience. And the camp has, has a kind of a heart, like a two-fold heart. They want to uh, really have a burden to show love to all the uh, adult handicapped people that come through the camp and uh, provide an incredible summer for them as well as for their care providers um, and just kind of give them a week or two uh, of just rest and knowing that people are, are taking care of uh, the people that they spend their entire lives dedicated to. And so it's, it's, a, one, it's a camp to provide kind of a, a little bit of a rest to them, but it's also a camp for students to come to its counselors. Um, and they have a huge heart for discipleship. And through the experience of the camp, using everything that the counselors are doing to continually mold them in their faith and point them to Jesus. Um, it, the summer that I worked there was probably one of the, the strongest summers of growth that I've ever had in my faith. Uh, it's something that God's done over that camp that is just it, it, through prayer and people coming along. Uh, he's just blessed that camp with the ability to pour into people and disciple. Um, and each summer they have a couple or they have a person come in and be disciplers. Uh, they have every day, it's a Christian camp, and every day that they have a, a time called intentional space. They do a chapel service for all the campers. And then during that, the, all the counselors will come into a small meeting and somebody will be there to lead them uh, in Bible studies and prayer, accountability, uh, worship and different things like that. And this summer, that will be the role that Sarah and I will be filling. Uh, we will be going in, and our primary task will be counseling counselors, uh, just because they'll be going through. It's kind of a lot of demands on them throughout the summer, uh, but we'll be uh, doing our best to lead them in daily Bible studies, to meet with them one-on-one, -on -one and check and see how they're doing. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, but, yeah, it, again, our time here has been incredible, and it's been a blast getting to know. We will have one more youth group uh, 
tomorrow night, and we'll have it at the in the park. Um, at the we're probably gonna grill out and have hot dogs and s'mores and stuff. We'll still meet at Hannah and Alex's house in the morning. As I said, it's just been an incredible time getting to know you guys, uh, serve alongside of you, and uh, we wish you were here for longer. And uh, we're excited for Ryan and Maggie as well. So thank you guys. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for our time together this morning and uh, the blessings in our lives. If we just take a few moments this morning and just, just pause and, and think, you've been so good to us. And, and part of our responsibility that you tell us, God, is to, to, to pass that along. And I thank you for Zach and Sarah and the opportunity that you've given them to spend their summer um, giving back the love that you've given them to others. God, I just pray you'd help each of us to realize that while we can go to other countries or we can go to other states, we have so many opportunities like that every day right where we live us to, to be very aware of the needs around us and to, and to love others in the way that you've loved us. I pray that you just would bless our service this morning and challenge us. I ask God that, that your presence would just be felt here this morning in, in a powerful way. Bless now as we just worship you through our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
me start by saying I believe mothers should be respected, loved, honored, cherished. Most certainly, they should be protected. Webster tells us that a mother is a female parent, one who gives birth. But for those of us with a good mom, we know of her even greater work. She was the one who was always there, knowing just the right time to say yes. Though hated then, we see now that even her no's were meant for our best. In times of hurt, her words captivated our hearts, working what some would call her mommy magic. We see now that it was just grace and love as she helped us through times so tragic. But before we get swept away in a world of fairy tales and myths, we give pause, realizing that Mother's Day for all is not a day of joy and bliss. For some people, the thought of Mother's Day causes them to mourn, for this day is one of great pain and suffering, a day where their heart is torn, divorced, abused, abandoned, words that have left many moms feeling alone as they never settle into their role, trying instead to protect the children in their home. And what about the pain endured by those who could never have a baby, leading them to believe that God's love is at best a maybe. For all you young ladies who long for the great treasure of a new birth, may I speak life into your heart. It is your heart, not your womb, that is the measure of your true worth. The emptiness you feel right now, because there is no life within your womb, can only be filled by the gospel, not a child, a job, or even a faithful loving groom. And others of you may be struggling from the fact that you bought the world's distortion. The pain you feel today is rooted in yesterday's abortion. Before we go any further, allow me to speak life where death may reign. Jesus' blood is sufficient to cleanse even the darkest sin stain and to heal the deepest soul's pain. Draw from your past, but don't live there, for to do so will turn your heart to stone. But look to the love of Jesus, a love that on an old rugged cross for the world was shown. On that cross, Jesus commissioned his earthly mom with a very exciting task, one that would change her world and another's. What was it, you ask? Behold your son, Mary, he spoke, concerning the disciple for whom he had a special love, an adoption at a funeral, something so beautiful it could have only been written from above. For all the moms who gained the status, not in a hospital, but rather in a court of law, we praise God that through adoption, you too answered the motherhood call, and finally, for those whose moms are no longer on this earth sod, we pray that today will find you cherishing the moments and the mothers given to you by God. Moms, we stand in your honor today. We thank you for all that you have done. May you continue to mom well until you can no longer see the sun. S-U-N, you know, the ball of fire that hangs in the sky. May the S-O-N reignite your passion. May you pass it on before you die. May all the hurts and the joys and the pains of your story simply not just be wasted, but may they from your memory be cut and on your children's hearts be pasted. Happy Mother's Day, moms. We truly value all your tendencies and yes, even your little quirks. But most of all, we thank you for modeling for us the truth that love truly works. I'd like for everyone here this morning who was born to a mother to please stand. <laughs> if you're not sure, you can stand also. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we stand together this morning, we, we stand in recognition of, of our moms. I thank you for this precious gift that you've given to each of us. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to show that, that love and appreciation 
appreciation that is so due. Lord, I, I just pray this morning for, for, for our moms that are here today, and the moms who aren't. And I ask, Lord, that, that you would just empower them, that you would just give them the patience, Lord, that is so often needed, strength, wisdom, Lord, as they wear so many hats and have so much responsibility. I ask God that, that you would just help us as a church to be a church that loves moms and that can relate to, to the needs that, that, that they face every day. I ask God that you would just help us to be a place, God, that, where they can come and just be, just be renewed and recharged and have just a source of, of that love and strength, God, just replenished. God, thank you for loving us. I just ask that this morning in a special way that you would just bless our mom. In Jesus' name. this time we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> last week we took up an offering for, uh, for Andrew's mission trip, and I just wanted to, to just thank you for responding so well 
it looks like the majority of this trip has been taken care of, and um, thank you for that. Um, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to be able to be a part of that blessing. This morning, we are <coughs> continuing our series on stories, and um, just to kind of refresh, get our heads back there, we, we, Jesus told a lot of stories, and they're called parables, and the word parable literally, literally means to come alongside of or to place alongside of. So what Jesus would do is he would take a, a concept that he was trying to get, help us to understand, and he would lay a story alongside of that that would illustrate that concept to, to make it become more real for us. And uh, this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, and we're going to read uh, several uh, stories, but uh, Luke 14, we're going to begin in verse 1. I'd like to invite you to turn with me as we read that together. So beginning in verse 1, it says this. It says, Now it happened as he, Jesus, went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you uh, uh, and him come to you, come and say to you, Give place to this man. Then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you should be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Interesting, isn't it? Just imagine having Jesus over for dinner, all right? What if you got the, the, the call this week that Jesus was coming over for dinner on Thursday night? What would your house look like this week, right? I can imagine. I know what it would look like at the Wallen house because it does look like that every Thursday night. We have people coming over. And so you take the house and then you do that, that quick run through, oh, you know, get your shoes out, do this, clean that up, wipe the dog stuff off the windows, the, the dog's nose rough up against the window, you know, and, and do, all, do all this stuff and get everything so that it's all ready and all perfect. Why do we do that? Because we want whatever you come over to our house for you to think that we live like that all the time, right? We don't. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's all show, all right? That's, that's not who we are. Uh, but we want you to think that. And, and, and so... If we, if we had Jesus and we knew that he was coming over to our house, probably the first thing we'd do is we, we'd go out and we'd clean the house. But really, here's kind of the thing about it. Jesus is not really interested in who you pretend to be. He's not interested in what you pretend to look like. And, and that's why many people don't like church, because they think that if they come to church, then what they're going to need to do is to, to clean their house and you know, do all that stuff so that wherever you go to church and you're sitting there, that people will see the person that you want them to see, and it's just exhausting. Jesus went to this dinner, and what I'm sure they thought was going to be an amazing night where they had this honored guest there, and that was really going to reflect well on them it really turned into a little bit of a nightmare for them. 
Because Jesus is having dinner with a group of people who think they're not broken. He's having dinner with a group of people who have made every pretense on the outside to look as though they're all together. But in reality, Jesus sees straight through this. So at the beginning of this dinner, we see in these, in these first couple of verses here, we see him introducing three things here that, that's really kind of interesting. You see, Jesus is not interested in what you pretend to be or what you want to be. He's interested in who you are right now. That's why he enjoyed eating with publicans and sinners. He was condemned for that, but he enjoyed that. Why? Because they were real. They were genuine. All right? When he went over to their house, they probably didn't clean up. Right? <laughs> they, they probably just, it is what it is. That's why he enjoyed talking to the woman at the well, because she was just very candid with him. That's why he enjoyed spending time with people who were sick and people who were hurting, because there was no pretense. They had needs. They knew their needs, and he was there to help meet them. You see, when we approach Jesus with this pretense or this idea that we're together, he's going to keep prodding, and he's going to keep, keep going until he gets to that place that reflects what you really are. Romans 3.23 tells us that we're all broken. The religious leaders felt like they had it all together. James 2.10 says that we are broken. It says, whoever should keep the whole wall and yet stumble on one point, he's guilty of all. We're all broken. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, there's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. We're, we're all broken. Revelation 3.16, Jesus says, so then because you're lukewarm, we've heard this verse before, but this is the context. And because you're lukewarm and you're neither cold, neither hot, he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are broken. Right? Broken manifests itself in several different ways. And at the beginning of this, we see that, that he, is, he is mentioning this, this idea of, of, of this lack of compassion, this lack of humility, and this lack of generosity. He starts off, and the dinner, it's interesting, he says he answers their question, but if you read it, he didn't ask a question. But there's this guy there, and he has dropsy. You know what dropsy is? It, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a condition where perhaps your liver is failing, or your heart is having issues, and it's kind of like an edema to an extreme place. It's, it's, it's where pools of fluid begin to gather in various parts of your body, and it's it's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. And uh, this guy is there. And Jesus asked a question, should I heal on the Sabbath? And, and there was silence. He said, should I heal this person who's hurting? Should I heal this person who has this condition? And nobody would even say yes. And he said, look, if your donkey falls into the pit on the Sabbath day, wouldn't you get it out? Every one of you would get it out. Why would we not want to help this guy on a Sabbath? They didn't have compassion. They were broken. Then in verse 7 through 11, we see the guests all fighting for the best seats at the table. And Jesus tells a story that would be so embarrassing, especially in their culture, something that you may have related to if you've ever been to a Reds game. If you've ever been to a Reds game, and you have tickets up here, and you try to sit down there, and you're sitting there, and then somebody comes and says, oh, I think you're in my seat. It's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> All right? All right? It's, so what would happen is, these guys were showing up early for this dinner, and they're all fighting, and Jesus just sitting there watching. And they're all fighting so they can get the seats closest to him, and they can get the seats of the, most, the best honor, and the best, best privilege that are there. And he looks at me and says, you're getting it all wrong. Take, take the lowest seats. And then let the guy come and say, hey, no, why don't you come sit over here? Instead of being here and the guy come and say, hey, what are you doing there? You need to go down there. He's talking about humility. They were broken. They didn't have compassion. They, weren't, they didn't have humility. And then he talked about the dinner circuit that they were on. They would one week invite people to come over this week, and we'll go to your house. Next week, we'll go to their house. 
It's kind of like on Wednesday mornings, I meet with a guy named Jack Phillips. I like, I, I really love Jack, and he's, we meet, and we're kind of like accountability partners. And um, we meet at McDonald's every Wednesday morning at 6.30. And uh, I buy his breakfast one week, and he buys my breakfast the next week. And uh, there's not a doubt in my mind that Jack would buy my breakfast every week. I know that he would. And I would buy Jack's breakfast every week. But I buy his and then he buys mine. Is there a lot of reward in that? I mean, do the math. I'm still paying the same amount for my breakfast, right? He's still paying the same amount for his. However, I have gotten pretty good at getting the more expensive stuff on his weeks. You know, that way it does work a little bit in my favor, right? But, but you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? And Jesus is saying, Let's, that's great. And spending time with each other, that's awesome. But let's do something more than that. Let's actually invite somebody over for dinner who could never really invite us to their house. Maybe they just can't afford it. Let's do that, he said, and then we'll be rewarded. Let's pay for somebody's meal who cannot pay you back. Generosity. They were lacking. They, they were broken. So, so that's kind of what leads into the story that we're going to be talking about this morning. And it begins in verse 15. So let's read this short story as he kind of sums up this, this meal that he's having with these religious leaders. It says, now when one of those who sat at the table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. All right? So what's happening? They're, 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 Jesus is making everybody really uncomfortable. All right? And so this guy's looking around, and you've got that awkward silence. So he's going, hey, change the subject. Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. All right? And so Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highway and hedges them, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. So as you read this, this story that Jesus begins to tell, we see God talking about this idea of a feast. And so he lays this idea of something that we can all relate to, and in our church we can definitely relate to the idea of feast, right? We love feasts at Community Baptist Church. Yesterday, we had a work day at the church, and the men came over, and we spread mulch at the church. And because we were over here for a full whole hour spreading mulch, right, Jim Spencer brought over breakfast, right? Now, I had already eaten breakfast. I had a nutritional two Pop-Tarts on the way over here uh, to, 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 to do the to mulch. But I was sitting there, and I was looking at this spread on the table, and and, uh, man, he laid it out there. He was Bob Evans, and it was biscuits, and it was gravy, and it was bacon, and it was French toast, and it was eggs, and it was, and I was looking at it thinking, you know, I really don't want to offend Jim if he's gone to all this work to bring this in. So I think I better eat a second breakfast, right? And I did, and it was awesome. We can relate to feasts, can't we? I mean, we, we, can, we can get that. So Jesus takes this idea of a feast which is something that every one of us would enjoy. And he compares it to salvation. So the feast is, is salvation. And, and that's interesting that Jesus chooses that to describe salvation because when you talk about somebody becoming a believer, a lot of pictures come to their mind, but oftentimes it's not the idea of a feast, more of a famine or more of a fast. 
if I get saved, wow, look at all this stuff I'm going to have to give up, and look at all this fun I can't have anymore, and all these things. But Jesus says, if you're doing this right, it's a feast. And so he compares this to a feast. He's speaking our language. We understand that. And it's something that we should really be able to relate to. Because our world is hungry and thirsty for God. They may not even know it. But there's something inside of them that is searching and is longing. We, at our small group this week, we were talking about the resurrection. And what we do in our small group is we basically, it's called the Discovery Bible Study. And so what we basically do is, in theory, I break the rules a lot, but in theory, you read a passage of Scripture, and you read it as though this is all you know about the Bible. If I read these verses in the Bible, and this was all I had and all I ever knew, what would this tell me about God? What would this tell me about people? What would this tell me? There's a series of questions. We ask the same questions pretty much every week, and we go through that. And this past week, we were reading about the resurrection. And I want you to think about that. Because we've become so um, overexposed, I don't want to say that, to the resurrection that, that, that it really doesn't mean what it should you realize that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you realize it means that he conquered death. I mean, what, what that really means, it's not just this, this church thing that goes on. What it really means, it means that people don't have to die anymore. Now, physically we'll die, our bodies will physically cease to function, but your soul, that which is you, will continue on. And every person who has ever been born has this innate knowledge that there is something more than this. And we feel it at certain times, and we especially feel it at funerals, and we, but we feel it where we know that there's got to be something more. And the reason we have those thoughts to begin with is because there is. And Jesus died, and then he rose from the dead on the third day and said that if we place our faith and trust in him, that he can do the same for us. What person is there today who does not want to experience that? I mean, if it's even a remote possibility, what person today would not want to at least explore that? Our world is hungry and thirsty for God. We're looking for love in wrong relationships. We're looking for peace in the wrong places. We're looking for fulfillment in our bank accounts. We're looking to escape through substances. We're participating in behaviors to be accepted. All the while, not knowing just how much Oftentimes, not knowing how much we're loved and accepted by God and how much love and acceptance they can find in, in the church. John 4, 13, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. The water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. It's fulfilling. Isaiah 55 says this. It says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. You see, the thing about a feast is you can have it spread out in front of you and still starve to death. You can look at it on the table and you can see the turkey and you can see the dressing and you can see the mashed potatoes and you can see the gravy and you can see the cranberry sauce and you can see the, the sweet potatoes and you can see, are you hungry yet? Because <laughs> I'm starving, right? So you can see all those things. But the fact that it's been prepared means nothing unless you partake of it. 
we have to partake, we have to eat, we can't just look at it, you can't just be around it. We have to be saved. You can be around church, you can know about Christianity, and, and that's a good start. But you don't starve to death until you partake. Yesterday the table was set, all I had to do was come. And I pulled up a chair. <laughs> and it was good. But he accepted Christ. I'm not asking. And I know this is, you know, we're mainly family. But I'm not asking, do you go to church? I'm not asking, do you know about the Bible? I'm asking, have you ever been saved? What a sad thing it would be to stand before God and have to say, yeah, I was there and the feast was all spread and I just never, never ate anything. I never made it personal. So the first part of the story is he's saying salvation is like a feast. And God has prepared it. He doesn't ask you to bring anything. You don't have to bring rolls. You don't have to bring, you know, corn. You don't have to bring any desserts. It's all ready. He's done the work. And the work was done on the cross. Right? Our job, the second part of this, is to invite people to come to Jesus. Now, how many of you have the UDF app? Right? <laughs> I like it, all right? Have you got your free stuff this week? That's what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, I'm going to take a minute, and I'm going to share something with you that's on the last day. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm going to share something with you that is absolutely amazing. You can go to the App Store and download the UDF app. If you go to the App Store and you download the UDF app, let me tell you what's been happening this week. One day, free milkshakes. At our house, you should hear the conversation that's taken place at our house. It's, it's been like, I'm not really hungry, but if there's a free milkshake with my name on it up at UDF, we're going, all right? Free milkshakes this week. You don't even have to buy anything. You just show up. You get your free milkshake. Free today. Is, isn't today free two-dip Sundays? Yeah, it's free two-dip Sundays today, all right? Ice cream cones, milkshakes. Yesterday was pints of ice cream. Go up, pick out a pint of ice cream. You don't even have to buy anything. Show them your app, free, out the door, all right? It's a good deal, all right? <laughs> all right, I'll give you a minute. Get your phones out. <laughs> Download the app. It's okay. It's, you're allowed. I'll do that. Right? How many should be downloading the app right now? I'm talking a free double dip Sunday today just to download the app. All right? That's a pretty easy sell, isn't it? <laughs> we have a pretty easy sell, too. You know, part of sales is, is first getting people to, to there, has, there has to be a need, and our whole world has a need. We're, we're inviting people to come to a feast that, that they need. A feast that is, it's a feast. It's a feast. It's amazing. It's free. Jesus paid for it on the cross. The table set with forgiveness and grace and peace and joy and eternal life. Eternal fulfillment. And it's our job to just get the word out. Now, I've told you about the UDF app, all right? Now I'm telling you about this. And as good as the UDF app is, this blows that out of the water. There's a feast that's for you. It's free. You don't need a smartphone. You just need to come to Jesus and say, I'm broken. I'm not going to pretend when I'm standing here talking to God, that I'm something that I'm not. I'm just going to place my faith and trust in you and watch and see what he does. You see, in Luke 14, as we read this story, the man representing God invited many. Then he sent, he sent his servants, that's us, to say, come. 
He didn't say do. He didn't say they had to. He just come. And then he told them to go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring them in. And they came back and said, there's still more room. And he said, I want my house full. Go out to the highways and hedges. Compel them to come in. That my house may be filled. God wants his house filled. He sends the invites. It's up to us, though. As, as we read this, I mean, that's really what, what our job is as a church. I've been emphasizing our mission statement, but our mission statement is to know Jesus and make him known while living, loving, and serving like, like him. To know Jesus and make him known while living, loving, and serving like him. To make him known, that's, 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 inviting, that's inviting people to the feast. Zach and Sarah are going to be doing it in Pennsylvania. Ryan and Maggie are going to be doing it in Nepal. We're going to be doing it in Harrison. Right? But it's our responsibility to make people know, let people know. Just like many of you had that sick feeling in your stomach when you thought of what you've missed at UDF this week. Imagine the sick feeling in your stomach to miss out on eternity. The last thing is in this story is, is it shows us in verse 18 it says they begin with one accord to make excuses. The first said to him, I, have, I bought a piece of ground, I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. The, another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. But still another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Excuses. It's not bad things. They're not bad things. I bought a piece of ground, I must go see it. Who buys land without looking at it first? Right? I bought five yoke of ox, and I'm going to go try them out first. Who would buy a car without test driving it? I got married, I can't come. Bring your wife. She's invited too. It's not, it's not that these people that were invited to the feast, were involved in these despicable behaviors. It, it's not that they were, were, were horrible people. They were just making really lame excuses to not come to the feast. And what I want you to look at this story, and it's important, is this. Is that God will have no patience with excuses for not coming to the feast. He will have no patience with excuses for not being saved. These people, again, they're not bad. They're, they're, they're kind of lame reasons. They thought they were good reasons. But what was the response? It says he was angry. He said, invite someone else. God will never force himself on you. He will honor your choice. But understand this, that if he invites you and keeps inviting you and, and you don't come, he may just move on and start inviting somebody else. A as we read this story, it's just kind of a, a great picture of kind of the way it's supposed to work for us individually and as a church. A relationship with God, it, 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 it's a feast. It really is. It's amazing. Somehow our world has been deceived into thinking that the relationship with Christ is like becoming a monk or something. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know how people live their lives without God in their life. There's just, there's just so many times to, to be able to go to God and know that, that there's some, some, some bigger picture, there's a bigger plan, there's something else going on here. That God has the ability and cares about me and loves about me and has a plan for my life. And that while he's so far above me, he cares intimately for me. I mean, it, it, it's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. It's a feast. And as we've been able to partake of this feast, 
we need to realize that there's people around us who are hungry and don't even know what they're hungry for. And the answer is, is, is right in this book. I mean, the answer is in the story of your life. The answer is in Jesus. And we have been asked by God who prepared this tremendous feast to go out and just make him known. And if somebody, we, we invite somebody and, and they don't accept that invitation, man, invite them again. Don't give up, but find somebody who will. God is never asking people to come and be something they're not. That's the awesome thing about Christianity. Our world has somehow made us think that you have to be something in order to be accepted by God, and, and you just have to be yourself. God will help you change once you become his child. That's our job. Is your relationship with God a feast, or has it been kind of a drought or a famine? Are we making him known? Are we inviting? Are, do we realize that, that while people around us, they have a lot of excuses for God not being a part of their life, they're, they're really, if you look at them, pretty lame excuses? So, so we invite, we go again, we go to the highways, we go to the hedges, we compel because this is so awesome to have and it's so horrific to not have how can we not share the message of God's love with those around us let's pray Heavenly Father Lord I thank you for our time together um, you are such an amazing God. I thank you, Lord, for this feast that you've prepared for us. It's a way to help us to understand what you want in our lives. It's, it, it's you telling us very plainly what you want in our lives. You want peace. You want abundance. You want you know, not necessarily money, but peace and joy and, and happiness and, and, and just all those things that we long for more than anything, your son, your forgiveness and grace. Thank you for doing all the work and preparation to make it possible through Jesus. Now help us, Lord, if, if we've never accepted you as our Lord and Savior to this, this morning look to you and say, God, this is who I am and I want to get saved. I, I want to place my faith and my trust in you. And I know you know who I am. I know you know I'm broken. And God, I know that, that that's the person that you look to with love, and I know that's the person you look to with acceptance. God, give us a burden for our world. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd like to invite you to stand just in attitude of prayer. I've got to ask you just a couple questions.
sure over the next several weeks there's going to be they're going to be very busy this week and I'm sure the next couple weeks are going to be busy and then things might slow down a little bit and you may start to think what am I doing you know and have these questions I want them to know that we're praying for them and I'd like them to do is I'd like them can you get over kind of stand in the middle there in the aisle pick on a spot and I'd like for us to just do something we don't usually do this but this is a pretty and I'd like for everybody to come and just kind of uh, let them know that you're praying for them. And uh, go ahead and come now. And let's just put your arms around them and bless them. We're going to have just a, a group, group prayer this morning for them. Just let them know. Come. If you, if you can't reach them, then reach somebody who's reaching them. And just place your hands on their shoulder. And let's pray together. You can hold hands, but let's. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this special young couple. For the blessing that they have been to us and to our church. Lord, I have mixed feelings because we, we hate to see them go because we're going to miss them. We are so excited. travel would go well, Lord, that their time of transition would go. I just pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon them, Lord, that you would just bless them. Keep them 
them safe, God. Give them boldness. Give them wisdom, Lord. Just give them a peace in this time in their lives. Pray for us as a church, Lord, that you'd help us to be faithful and prayerful. To meet their needs, to support and encourage them in any way that we can. I ask you to bless them. sure to get by and uh, say goodbye to them and uh, let them know you'll be praying for them. And we're going to close out with a song.